Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Unit 6, Induction and an Overview of Informal Fallacies. In this video, we'll take a brief look at the nature of fallacies, focusing on the four main families of informal fallacies that occur in inductive arguments. We've already learned that logic, the systematic investigation of reasoning, has uncovered two distinct systems or methods of reasoning, formal or deductive logic, and informal or inductive logic. In our investigation of Aristotelian and propositional logic, we've learned that deductive arguments give us necessary conclusions, because the connection between the premises and the conclusion is determined by how we put the argument together. If we follow the rules of a deductive system, and form our arguments correctly, we achieve validity. If it also turns out that the premises are true, then we get a sound argument as well. But the inductive system of reasoning is quite different. With induction, we can only ever achieve conclusions that will follow the premises with a degree of probability. No matter what kind of evidence we offer for our conclusion, no matter how much evidence we acquire, we will never be able to achieve certainty when using inductive methodologies. To put it more simply, there's always the possibility that our conclusion might be incorrect when it comes to induction. So when we evaluate inductive arguments, we can't call them valid or sound. Instead, if we get sufficient evidence for a conclusion following the inductive method, we say the argument is strong. If we have a strong induction that also has true premises, we call it a cogent argument. Now, up to now, we've been focusing our attention on getting arguments right, but it's appropriate for us to also spend some time on the ways in which arguments can fail. In logic, we label an argument a fallacy when we're trying to use reason to reach a conclusion or persuade an audience, but something goes wrong. Our conclusion does not follow from the premises. We have a non sequitur. In a deductive system of reasoning, a fallacy is caused by violating one of the finite rules that governs the particular logical game. Generally speaking, a formal fallacy is some error in the form or structure of the argument. For example, we've learned why an argument in the form of modus ponens works. The antecedent of a conditional statement is supposed to be a sufficient condition for the consequent. So, if we know that a sufficient condition holds, we must have the consequent as well. But notice that the same thing doesn't hold if we try to deny the antecedent. While having a match might be a sufficient condition to start a fire, it certainly doesn't follow that if we don't have a match, we can't have a fire. There are other ways of starting a fire. So denying the antecedent of a conditional proposition will not yield a necessary conclusion. Any argument of this form is said to be fallacious. So formal fallacies are always about the structure of the argument. If it's formed correctly, the conclusion must follow. If it's formed incorrectly, the conclusion will not follow. Informal fallacies are completely different. Since an inductive argument doesn't yield necessary conclusions, the form of the argument doesn't really matter. Or maybe it would be easier to think of it the other way around. Since the conclusion can't follow necessarily, the form of the argument really isn't a matter of concern. In some of our previous videos, we've likened deduction to a chain of reasoning where each premise is a link in a chain which must be connected to the conclusion. It's the fact that the links are all connected in the correct way that makes the chain useful. But with inductive reasoning, there will always be a gap between the premises and the conclusion. A good induction is going to minimize the gaps but an informal fallacy will always cause us to fall short.
I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. This is the greatest thrill of my life. I'm king of the world. Woohoo! Woohoo! I. Ah! Oh! 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 Given that there are no formal rules that govern induction, there are a myriad of ways for our inductions to pull a homer. But we generally recognize four distinct kinds of defects in the evidence of inductive arguments. The first group of informal fallacies all have to do with the relevance of the evidence contained in the argument. We call these defects fallacies of relevance. For example, you should get an iPhone. It's the phone that popular and smart people use. Now, we can clarify this argument by putting it into standard form, and when we do that, we see that there are actually two premises and one conclusion. The conclusion is that one should buy an iPhone, presumably because they're better than other kinds of smartphones. But look at the evidence that's supposed to support this conclusion. The premises tell us that popular and smart people buy iPhones. But why should that lead me to conclude that I should too? This argument isn't using reason to convince me to buy an iPhone. It's appealing to my emotions. There are many factors that should inform the choice of phone one buys, the functionality of the phone, what you're going to use it for, cost, etc. But my desire to be seen as popular or smart is not relevant to which phone is best for me. The second group of fallacies we'll examine have to do with the sufficiency of the evidence. Do I have enough evidence to make my conclusion more probable than not? All my classmates in college were heavy drinkers, so it's safe to conclude that all undergraduates use too much alcohol. Notice here I'm drawing a conclusion about all college undergraduates based on my personal experience with a few undergraduates. Of course, we already learned in term logic that it only takes a single counterexample to falsify a universal claim, which is why we want to be careful with generalizations. We don't want to be too hasty. Satisfactory evidence for this conclusion would require a much larger sample of the undergraduate population, and we'd probably also want to weaken our conclusion a bit, instead say most or many, instead of all since we know that induction can only get us probable conclusions, not certain ones. A third type of error that can undermine an inductive argument involves making unwarranted assumptions within the context of the argument. We all know what happens when you assume, and we'll discover a whole group of fallacies that occur when we allow presumptions or assumptions to slip into our arguments. Here's a fairly common example of making an unwarranted assumption within the context of an argument. In standardized form, we see that we're pointing to our observations that the universe is an orderly place, and from that fact, that observation, we're concluding that the cause of the observation is a single intelligent creator. What this argument assumes is that order or regularity can only be caused by the intervention of an intentional agent. While it might be the case that the order we observe in the cosmos is due to the intervention of a creator, it also might be caused by something else. The point is, we can't assume that it's the only explanation. The fourth group of informal fallacies we'll examine in the following videos have to do with problems of ambiguity, which can infect the premises of our arguments. Clarity, precision, and univocality are virtues that are highly prized by philosophers. Our next example makes clear why these are virtues. In standard form, we can see that the term man is being used in two very different senses in premises 1 and 2. In the first, it's used universally to refer to human beings, while in the second, it's referring to sex. The confusion about the meaning of the terms leads to a fallacious inference. Equivocation 
is always to be avoided in the context of argument, and it's probably best to avoid it at all times if we wish to co effectively communicate with others. These four groups of defects are by no means exhaustive. There are perhaps as many ways for inductive arguments to fail as there are for them to succeed, but these groups represent the most common types of errors that weaken inductive arguments in fields as diverse as biopharmacology to literary criticism. In the series of short videos that follow, we'll take a quick look at some of the more common examples of fallacies of each kind. But until then, keep in mind that inductive arguments fail not because they're formulated in the wrong way, but rather, like Homer, they fail to make the inferential leap across the Springfield Gorge of Reason. We'll see you next time for a little bit of logic.